صلى الله عليك يا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا شهيد يا مظلوم يا غريب كربلاء يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله لا إله إلا هو ليجمعنكم إلى يوم القيامة لا ريب فيه ومن أصدق من الله حديثا صدق الله العلي العظيم <تصفيق> نور مجالسكم بذكر الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد Brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The concept of the Day of Judgment, the Day of Reckoning, a day in which every single human being shall be tried before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they will be held accountable for all the deeds and actions that they have done. A day in which the evil human beings will finally be punished in the fires of hell of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the good will receive the reward an eternal dwelling in the heavens of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if, if you can please uh, remove the echo brothers in the room so this concept the concept of a day of judgment in which we are all trying is a universal concept every divine religion believes in and accepts and when you come to the religion of Islam you find that this concept this belief is a fundamental and critical belief of this religion it's so important that the belief in the day of judgment is one of the five pillars of Islam usul al-deen we all know usul al-deen we have five main pillars of Islam the five main beliefs. And the fifth of Usul al is what? Al Ma'ad. The belief in the Day of Judgment. So, this is how important this concept is, how this belief is, that it's amongst the pillars of Islam. What do we mean the pillars of Islam? Meaning, if someone, if a Muslim, decides one day to reject this belief or to question it, a Muslim says that, you know what? It's not proven to me that there is a Day of Judgment. If he questions this fact, then this person is no longer a Muslim. You can't consider yourself a Muslim. It's a pillar of Islam. Without the pillar, you cannot have the building. So this is <clears throat> the concept of the Day of Judgment. And you find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He speaks about the Day of Judgment. Brothers, the, the echo please. If you can please remove the echo entirely. This is very distracting. Salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the Day of Judgment many times in the Quran. Sayyid al-Taba Taba'i, the, the author of Tafsir al-Mizan, the famous Tafsir al-Mizan, he mentions that I once analyzed the Quran and I tried to find out how many times does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speak about the day of judgments in the Quran. To your surprise, brothers and sisters, he says that I found approximately 2,000 verses in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala either directly or indirectly speaks about the day of judgment and he speaks and or he refers to the day of judgment now maybe it's yawm al qiyamah as it's mentioned in this in this wording but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the concept that there is a day of judgment and people will be held responsible for their actions almost 2000 verses 
The Holy Quran has almost 6,600 6, verses. So almost a third or a fourth of the Quran. The book of guidance is about the day of judgment, is about Yawm al Qiyamah. What does this tell you? This tells you that this is a very important belief in the religion of Islam. You find in some verses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the importance of this belief. In many verses, Allah, when He says, He speaks about the believers, He says, Those that believe in Allah, and then those that believe in the Day of Judgment. Amanu billah wal yawm al akhir. Many times you'll find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, once He mentions the belief in God, which is the most important belief, right after that He says, Wal yawm al akhir. You find in other verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He speaks about the consequences of the belief and the disbelief in the Day of Judgment. He tells us that, that there is a reward just for believing in the Day of Judgment. And He speaks so highly of those that believe in the Day of Judgment. They haven't done anything, just they accepted this belief. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rebukes and scolds those that reject this idea and how they will be punished just for disbelieving in this day. In other verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the events of the Day of Judgment. What will happen on the Day of Judgment and how will it unfold? And in other verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the punishment of that day. What types of punishment? What are the features of the fires of hell? Some of the qualities of the fires of hell? How will people be punished in the fires of hell? And He also speaks about the reward that the good will receive on that day. The types of reward and He speaks about the Jannah, the heaven. So this is a very important belief in Islam. And in the Holy Quran, the Day of Judgment, the Mufassirin of the Quran, the commentators, they state that the, the Day of Judgment has over 70 names in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed 70 names for the Day of Judgment in the Quran. One of them obviously, Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Another, Yawm Al-Hisab. Yawm Al-Hasra. Yawm Al-Taghabun. Yawm al jama al waqiah al haqqa al tamma al sakha and so on and so forth. Over 70 names that refer to the Day of Judgment. And in our ahadith we find another 30 names. So the total being 100 names for the Day of Judgment. What does this tell you? Why there are so many names? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to tell us this point. That this is a very important belief. That the Day of Judgment is very important. And thus I keep on giving it so many names. Because it's so important. So that we're constantly reminded of the day of judgment. Now you might ask, why is this belief so important? Why is this concept so important in Islam that almost a third of the Quran is speaking about the day of judgment, 100 names? What's so important about it? Now there are many reasons, but I'll mention only two tonight. Number one, why the belief in Yawm Al-Qiyamah, the day of judgment, is so important is that without the belief in the Day of Judgment, without the Day of Judgment, we cannot prove the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So basically, the justice of Allah depends on the Day of Judgment. How? Now you see, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have created us, and there's only this dunya, there's no akhirah, just like an atheist believes. We die and there's nothing after that. Allah speaks about some people who used to believe in that. إِنْ هِيَ إِلَّا حَيَاتُنَا الدُّنْيَا وَمَا نَحْنُ مِمَبْعُوثِينَ There is no akhirah, there is no resurrection. It's only this dunya. Now if Allah would have created only this dunya and there's no akhirah, and there are so many criminals, oppressors, tyrants, rulers, that commit so much injustice and tyranny, and oppression, and they get away with it, you see, in this dunya. Nobody holds them accountable, either because nobody knows about their evil, or because we don't have the authority, we don't have enough power to hold them accountable. Now, if Allah would have created this dunya without an akhirah, a judgment day, and He would let these criminals get away with their crimes, this, brothers and sisters, would disprove the justice of Allah. This would show that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala failed May God forbid that he failed to implement justice. 
He created all these human beings and justice wasn't served. Because as we know, there is no justice always in this dunya. Sometimes justice is served. Most of the times, the, the criminals, the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala get away with it. Now let's imagine, you heard a few days ago, that one of the ulama of the, the country that's so-called Saudi Arabia, he was sentenced to ex execution, a Shaykh al-Nimr. You heard about that. Now let's say this kingdom of Saudi Arabia, they go ahead and execute him. For what? Just because he voiced his opinion about the country. That's it. Nothing. That's all he did. He voiced his opinion about the country and about the corruption and about the tyranny that exists in that country. Let's say they go ahead and they execute that person. Will anyone defend him? Even if someone tries to defend him, will that be of use? Obviously in the West you won't hear anything. You won't hear a single word, even though this person is a person who is being persecuted just for his right, just for his view, just for his opinion, but obviously no one will defend. Let's say they go ahead and they execute him. Who will hold them accountable in the dunya? No one. The king will die peacefully on his bed, on his deathbed, and the next king will come, and the next, and next, and next. Who's going to hold them accountable? No one. So is justice served? No. So in the dunya, many times justice is not served. So if there is no akhirah, that means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala failed in implementing justice. So the day of judgment proves the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, maybe there is no justice in this dunya, but there will come a day in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will avenge all the victims. He will avenge all those that were oppressed and he will punish all the oppressors and all the evil ones. So the day of judgment proves the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as we know, we said the fifth pillar of Islam is the day of judgment. The second pillar of Islam is what? Is the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these two pillars of Islam are interconnected. If you disprove, if you reject the day of judgment, not only have you rejected the fifth pillar of Islam, but you have also rejected the second pillar of Islam, and that is the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the first point. Why the belief in the Day of Judgment is so important? Why? Because it proves the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, the second reason why it's so important is because there are so many benefits that the human being benefits from just by believing in this day. Just the belief in the Day of Judgment reaps so many benefits for the human being. And I'll mention three. Number one, the first benefit in believing in the Day of Judgment. How, I, how do I benefit just from believing in the Day of Judgment? Number one, this belief, it keeps the human being in check. How? And that once the human being knows that every action is monitored and anything he will do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask him, will hold him accountable. And if he does any injustice towards anyone, if he infringes on the rights of any human being, if he exceeds the boundaries, the limits, if he oppresses any being, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish him. Now if I have this mentality, if I have this view, if I believe in such a fact, obviously what's going to happen? I'm going to behave. Obviously I'm going to think twice before I oppress another person because I know that there is a consequence because I know there is a punishment and you find brothers and sisters that so many times there is oppression that's done while no one witnesses that oppression except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so if I don't believe in a day of judgment or if I don't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what will prevent me from doing that oppression I could oppress someone and no one will find out. I could steal and no one will find out. What will deter me from doing that if I don't believe in the Day of Judgment? You see, in the dunya, we obey the law as long as we're monitored, as long as they're watching me. But what happens if I could get away with breaking the law? Do you think I will think twice about that? If I can go inside a bank, rob it, no one will find out. Who will? Most human beings won't think twice about that. Why? Because the reason why they don't break the law is because they fear the consequence. If the consequence, if the punishment isn't there, they're not going to fear anything. And many times in this dunya, either 
the law does the you know the governments the authorities they never find out or they fail in punishing that criminal but but you find the belief in the judgment day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if I believe that there is a judgment day and everyone will will be held accountable I will behave all the time because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching me no matter where I go. And even if it's the smallest evil I do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish me for that. So this is the best system, the best way that ensures the human being behaves. Even if he's all by himself. Why? Because he will see the consequence. Nothing is forgotten. Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam, he mentions a story. He says that one day a man, he boarded a ship. He went on a journey on a ship in the ocean and he took his family with him. He says, and during that trip, the ship wrecked and it drowned and everyone died except his wife. His wife was the only person that remained living. The Imam says, so she kept hanging on a piece of you know wood from that ship that was floating and she eventually reached the shorelines of an island a deserted island but there was only one person that was living on that island the imam says this was a very evil man there was not any haram the imam says that that person would do very evil man so she arrives at this island all of a sudden, he comes across her. Now there is another human being in this island. There is another being. So he asks this lady, this woman, are you a human being or are you a jinn? Because he was so amazed. What brings a human being to this island? Maybe it's a jinn. She tells him, I'm a human being. So now he's happy. Finally, he finds a woman. So what does he do? The imam says he's very evil. He decides to rape that woman. So he wants to rape that woman while or before he rapes her, he notices that she's very afraid. She's shivering. She's shaking. So she, he tells her, what are you afraid of? Why are you so afraid? Basically, maybe he's mocking her. You know, why are you so afraid? Why are you shivering? So she, tell, she doesn't say anything. She just looks at the sky and she says, I'm afraid of that. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She tells him, I am afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of what's going to happen. This huge haram that you're going to do. So this man, subhanAllah, you see sometimes it only takes one word for an evil man to transform into a good man. So, and this was it. This was the word that changed him. He told her that, what did you do? Why are you afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Have you done anything wrong? She says, no, but yet I'm afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He tells her, Subhanallah, you have not done any haram, but yet you fear Allah. So what should I say? What should I do? I am committing such a great haram and I don't fear Allah. And you have not committed any haram and you fear Allah. I should fear Allah more than you. He got up and he just walked away. He was all alone in that island. No one, he could have killed her. No one would have even known. Especially back then, thousands of years ago. What deterred him from committing this injustice? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why fear Allah? Because there is a day of judgment. Allah, maybe you will get away with this evil act, this crime in the dunya. But don't think you will get away with it in the akhirah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will serve justice. Allah will punish you in the akhirah. This is what deterred him. So this is number one. The first benefit of the belief in the day of judgment is that it keeps us in check. We behave because we know there is a punishment and we will never get away with any crime or oppression. Number two, the second benefit of the belief in the day of judgment is that it encourages us to always do good. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will count that good deed for me and Allah has promised to reward me. Like we said in the first point, many times in this dunya, we do good things but we're never rewarded. And in those instances where I do good and I'm not rewarded, obviously, this is a huge setback. I mean, if I want to do good and there's a chance that I won't be rewarded, why should I do that good if there's no akhirah? Just looking at it in the dunya. 
If I was to donate, you see some people they donate, they give for the causes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they do, you know, charitable, uh, they make charitable organizations, they give to, you know, charity. And their prime incentive is what? Either to be recognized, so that once you go on his website, you see all the, you know, all the donations that he's given, or that he boasts about it and people speak about him posit positively and that's a reward that he receives in the dunya being recognized or you find in the, in the West some people they give charity because it's counted as a tax exempt so he says you know what the money is going anyway so let it go to charity but imagine if I was to donate and no one knows nobody finds out nor is it tax exempt? And I don't believe in the Day of Judgment. What's the incentive? Why should I donate? Why should I help the poor? I'm not recognized. There's no tax exempt. And there's no akhira reward. So what's the incentive? If there's no belief that there's a Day of Judgment and there's a reward for this, obviously there's no incentive for me to do that. And you find many times in the dunya, brothers and sisters, some people they do good deeds, but the reward is lost. They do such a good deed, but no one even remembers them. We have so much ulama, brothers and sisters, living in the house. They have so much knowledge. They've written such great books, but nobody knows about them. They're not, they, they could barely even pay their rent. Why? Because this is how this dunya is. It doesn't always repay you for your hard work and for your good. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never forgets any good deed, any good that we do. Now, He may not repay you in this dunya, it will pay you in the Akhirah. And not only is sometimes the reward forgotten, sometimes other people, they take credit for my work. They steal my work, brothers and sisters. How many times has this happened? How many stories have you heard? I do something good, a person does something good, but someone else steals the credit. Someone else is credited for that work. They say, Alam, the, the Alam that wrote the book of Al-Ghadir, he spent his entire life writing it. Once he wanted to publish it and, you know, make some money off of it, even though that was not his incentive, he did it for Allah, but he wanted to make some money out of it. A publisher, he took that book without his consent and he published it. And all his efforts in the dunya was lost. This happens many times. Look at Ahlul Bayt salam. Look at Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam. If it was not for him, there, were, there would have been no Islam. Islam was built on his sword. But now, unfortunately, most of the Muslims, he's deemed as the fourth Khalifa. He's only the fourth most important. Did Imam Ali receive his reward in his dunya? Of course not. For 70 years, they used to curse him on the minbar. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, did not receive his reward. None of Ahlul Bayt. Who knows about Ahlul Bayt? The Shia barely know about the Imams. Brothers and sisters, if you ask a typical Shia, tell me, a few, tell me one or two stories from Imam Al-Hadi, from Imam Al-Jawad. They would stutter, they would hesitate, let alone the, the, you know, the non-Shia Muslims, let alone the non-Muslims. Were Ahlul Bayt salam, rewarded, recognized? Obviously not. So where is their ajr? Where is their reward? It's in the Akhirah. So if I believe that there is a day of judgment and every small deed that I do that's good, Allah will count it for me and will reward me. I won't hesitate in doing good. So what? Even if... I do good and nobody thanks me. I'm not recognized. Nobody gives me a reward in the dunya. In the akhirah, Allah will give me a reward that's a thousand times greater than any reward of the dunya. And thus a believer, a mu'min, that believes in the day of judgment will never hesitate to do good. So that's number two. It encourages us to do good. Number three, the third benefit of the belief of the day of judgment is that it gives patience and satisfaction to those that are oppressed in this dunya, to those that are not fortunate, the unfortunate, to those that suffer so much in this dunya. Can you imagine if I was born in Africa, in those jungles, and I have absolutely no means of civilization. I'm born in the jungle, no education, nothing. And I live in the worst you know, I suffer from the worst cases of poverty. Chances are high that, I'll, that, that I will die 
from a hunger or thirst. And on top of all of that, all the world's diseases are in Africa. You know, every disease that we hear, hear of, it originates, or most of them originate in Africa. Like right now you hear about the Ebola disease. So a person living in Africa, what would, why would he even live if there's no Akhirah? There is nothing but suffering for him in the dunya. But if that person living in Africa believes that this is a short dunya, it will pass and there's an akhirah and it's eternal. Obviously, this will give him patience, correct? This will console him. He won't, he won't want to commit suicide anymore. He won't want to end his life. He will see a reason, he'll find a reason for himself to live. Can you imagine, brothers and sisters, right now, for example, in Bahrain, there are so many innocent people that are imprisoned. All of them Shia, followers of Ahl al-Bayt They're imprisoned for nothing, for no crime that they have committed, just because they protested against the government and they acted, they asked, requested for their rights in a peaceful way. They demanded for their rights, their legitimate rights in a peaceful way, they were imprisoned. Imagine, I know personally someone who is, was sentenced for 10 years. Now that person in this dunya, he was abandoned by the dunya. The government of the West complete aban completely abandoned the, you know, the Bahrain uprising. Absolutely no one speaks for them. Absolutely no one defends them. Even though you see in Syria, they speak about freedom and they speak about rights and they speak against the government and why does he give them freedom? But when it comes to Bahrain, nothing. You don't hear anything. So someone who is imprisoned in Bahrain, what would give him patience? He sees in the dunya, that says dunya is gone. The people of the dunya have abandoned him. No one is defending him. What gives that person in those prisons of Al Khalifa, what gives him patience? What gives him patience? That he knows there is a day of judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish all these evil dictators. Allah will avenge that person. Allah will punish the dictators. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will seek retribution. That's what gives them patience. Or else he would have to commit suicide if there was no day of judgment. So the belief in the day of judgment, brothers and sisters, it gives peace, tranquility, satisfaction to those that are oppressed in the dunya. They know this is not it. There is a day in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will avenge them. And that's why I always say, brothers and sisters, if you lose a haqq in this dunya, if your rights are not given to you, whether it's by the government, whether it's by a person, if you are oppressed in this dunya, someone steals your money, anything, don't worry, brothers and sisters. Some people will have a heart attack if someone steals them and that's it. They can't, there's no way for them to get, that, get it back. Don't worry, there's a day of judgment. We believe that on that day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you everything back a thousand times more. If someone steals from me, from the wounds of the dunya, and I get my haqq back in this dunya, it's so minimal. But if I get my haqq back in the akhirah, Allah will give it to me 1,000 times greater. So I shouldn't worry if someone oppresses me. I shouldn't worry if someone does injustice towards me because it's all being monitored. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will avenge me. And that's, you find on the day of Ashura, this is what gave Imam al Hussein alayhi salam patience. Brothers and sisters, the tragedies and the calamities that fell on Imam al Hussein were great. Mountains cannot hold it. Can you imagine his own child is killed in his own hand? And they're doing all of that in the name of Islam. Can you imagine how Imam al Hussein felt? They're killing me, the grandson of Rasulullah, in the name of Rasulullah. And I'm the representative of Allah. What gave him patience? that he saw his entire family massacred and he knew that once he is killed, they will attack his family. They will attack the woman. He knew all of that. What gave him patience? Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he stood like a mountain. He stood like a lion. He didn't break down on the day of Ashura. On the other hand, we see that narrators say that we saw Imam al Hussein, the, the more the tragedies became, the more he used to smile, the greater his smile would become. What gave him patience? He himself, Imam al Hussein, is narrated saying, after they killed Ali ibn al Asghar Abdullah al Radi, what did he say? He said, What gives me consolation, what gives me patience, that Allah is watching all of this. 
He's, it's as if he's speaking to Yazid Umar ibn Sa'ad. Don't think that you won, that you killed me and my family. No, there's a day of judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish you 100,000 times greater than what you did to me in the dunya. This is what gives me patience. And before they were killing him, and in those last seconds while they were hitting him with stones and with the sword and a spear went through his chest, he raised his hand and he says, Oh Allah, what gives me patience that you're watching all of this and you will avenge me on the day of judgment. And when he sent his son Ali al-Akbar to the battlefield, what did he say? Imam al Hussein he said, Allahumma shad annahu qad baraza ilayhim ashbahu nas khalqan wa khulqan wa mandqan bi rasulim. Oh Allah, you are the witness. The Ali al-Akbar is the replica of Rasulullah. He's the most human being that resembles Rasulullah. But yeah, they want to kill him. It's as if they want to kill Rasulullah. You're witnessing this. So this gave consolation to Abu Abdullah al Hussein. And likewise, a person that believes in the day of judgment, this gives him consolation. This gives him tranquility. He knows Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will avenge him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him all his haq, his right, on the day of judgment. And that's why, brothers and sisters, we find this topic, this concept, this belief of the day of judgment is very important in Islam. It's one of the five pillars of faith. And inshallah, during the, the few nights that will <coughs> approach us, these ten nights of Muharram, I will speak more about the day of judgment and about these events of the day of judgment what will happen on the day of judgment how it will unfold i'll speak more about that inshallah when we read the quran we see that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he tells us that anytime he used to send a messenger he used to tell the people about tawheed the belief in the oneness of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the belief in the day of judgment but we find most of the tribes most of the nations of the prophets they used to disbelieve in the day of judgment. Why? Why did they reject the idea that there is a day that we will be judged? There's a few reasons. Number one, brothers and sisters, some of them, it was because of their arrogance. It was because of their stubbornness. They would say, our parents didn't believe in the day of judgment, my forefathers. So why should I? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about them, قَالُوا أَإِذَا مِتْنَا قَالُوا أَإِذَا مِتْنَا when we die, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will resurrect us. And then they say, He says, yes, yes, we've heard this story before. We've heard these myths, these fairy tales before. Our, our parents also heard, them, heard, heard, heard of them. They disbelieve, so we will disbelieve. They used to call them myths. So did they have any logic to reject it? No. Did they have any proof? No. It was just because out of arrogance, it was out of stubbornness. You find other people, the Holy Quran tells us that they used to disbelieve in the day of judgment because they saw that it was impossible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to resurrect the human being. They used to say that, look, once the human being dies, we look in the grave, we see the human being's body, what happens? It decomposes, it rots, it turns into soil. How is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala able to recompose the human being after he turns into rotten bones and soil? How can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recreate the human being? How can he recompose him? That's impossible. If I can please request the brothers to get up and come closer to the member so we can create room in the back. Salla ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So they saw that it was beyond the capabilities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to revive the human being. And thus they disbelieved. Allah says in the Holy Quran, وَيَقُولُ الْإِنسَانَ أَإِذَا مَا مِتُّ لَسَوْفَ أُبْعَثُ حَيَّا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the human being says that when I die, after I die, there is a day that Allah will resurrect me, that I will once again walk and speak, and I'll have another life. 
They rejected this point that we, the human being thinks that we're not capable of gathering his bones and reviving him and recomposing him after he is decomposed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran, He gives four answers to this misconception that Allah cannot. It's impossible for Allah. It's beyond His capabilities. The first answer that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He tells the human beings, Look, who created you to begin with? Didn't I create you? What did I create you, create you out of? Allah created us out of nothing. He innovated us. Ibda. Allah created us out of nothing. So Allah tells them, if I was able to create you in the beginning out of nothing, you think now that I already created you, the model is there, but you've only rotted, you've turned into rotten bones, you think that now I'm not capable of recomposing you, reassembling you? Obviously, if I was able to create you out of nothing, it's much easier for me to now to recompose you. Yeah, Allah answers, He says, أَوَلَا يَذْكُرُ الْإِنسَانِ does the human being not remember that he was nothing? That he was nothing and we created out of nothing. And in another verse, he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for him to create, for him to recompose us, it's much easier than to create. He says in one verse, it's easier for Allah to recompose us after he has created, created us out of nothing, innovation is always easier than recomposing, reassembling. Do you think it's harder to invent a new device, let's say the iPhone, or is it harder to reassemble a broken iPhone? If you take a broken iPhone to, the, you know, to Apple and you tell them, fix this, is this harder or innovating the iPhone to begin with harder? Obviously, innovation is much more difficult. Allah innovated you. Now that he innovated you out of nothing, you don't think he can revive you? So that's number one. Allah says, look, I created you out of nothing. Obviously, it's much easier to reassemble you. That's number one. Number two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, look at the universe. Do you think the universe is greater or you reviving you? Obviously, the universe is much greater. I created the universe. You don't think I can revive you? A small human being that's a dot in this universe. Allah says in the Holy Quran, أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْا إِلَى السَّمَاوَاتِ إِلَى السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْا أَنَّ اللَّهَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلَمْ يَعْيَ بِخَلْقِهِنَّ And it was so easy for him to create the universe. بِقَادِرٍ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يُحْيِي الْمَوْتَ Allah is not able to revive the human being. بَلَىٰ إِنَّهُ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ Allah can do anything. So that's number two, Allah created the universe. Number three, Allah tells them that you think it's impossible for me to create life out of the soil. Allah says that every day I create life out of the soil. Just take a seed and plant it. There's no life. And then all of a sudden you have a tree. You have a flower. How? There was death, there was nothing, and then you have life. Every day this is an example in front of us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, if I am able to create life every day from the soil, why do you think it's possible for me to reassemble, recreate you, recompose you? And number four, finally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives examples of people that were revived in this dunya. So if Allah was able to revive people in this dunya after they died, you don't think He can do it in the akhirah? Allah, for example, He gives the example of Prophet Ibrahim. And how he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, show me how you revive. And he <clears throat> told him to take four birds and kill them. And you know, uh, you know, cut them up into pieces, put them on different mountains. And then in the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he revived those birds. Allah says that in the Holy Quran as an example. Allah mentions us the stories of Prophet Isa. He was able to revive the dead. This happened. This is not something that's going to happen. It already happened. Allah mentions the story of Prophet Uzair, of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put him to death, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala resurrected him. And of three other instances in Bani Israel, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revived dead human beings. So Allah tells us in the Holy Quran, if I was able to do it in this dunya, why do you think it's impossible for me to do it in the next life? I'll do it again. If I did it once, I'll do it again. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, you know what? The true reason for many human beings' denial and rejection of the Day of Judgment is not because they think it's impossible. No, they know it's possible, perfectly possible. Why do they reject? They use this as an excuse that it's impossible. 
The real reason is because they want to get away with their evil, with their crimes. They want to avoid accountability because now if you admit that there is a day of judgment, that means everything that you do that's evil, you'll be held accountable, you'll be punished. They want to avoid that accountability. They don't want their conscience to what? To rebuke them, to scold them, to haunt them. So they say, you know what, let me just deny that there is a day that I'll be held accountable. The Holy Quran says, أَيَحْسَبُ الْإِنسَانَ أَلَّنَّ جْمَعَ عِبَامَ The human being thinks that we will not be able to gather his bones after he dies. Allah says, بَلَى No. قَادِرِينَ عَلَىٰ أَن نُسَوِّيَ بَنَانَا We are able to do that. And then he says, بَلْ يُرِيدُ الْإِنسَانَ لِيَفْجُرَ أَمَامَا The real reason why the human being rejects يوم القيامة is why? Because he wants to do evil because he wants to oppress because he wants to indulge himself in haram in the desires he doesn't want someone to constantly tell him hey be careful don't do this you'll be held accountable don't do this this is haram it's annoying to him so he says let me just reject this idea that there is a day of reckoning there is a day that i will be tried before allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for every small deed that i do allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold me accountable so that's why they reject the akhirah and you see Umar ibn Sa'ad, brothers and sisters, why did he reject the Akhirah? Why did he kill Imam Hussein? You see, when he was offered to kill Imam al Hussein, what did he say? He said, يَقُولُونَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ خَالِقُ جَنَّةٍ وَنَارٍ وَتَعْذِيبٍ وَغَلِّ يَدَيْنِي He wanted to kill Imam al Hussein, but he needs an excuse. He needs to cover it up. So what did he do? He began to doubt that there is a day of judgment. He says, they say there is a day of judgment and there is... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the hellfire and he'll punish the evil and there is a jannah. Yaqulun, I'm not sure of that. Why? Just so he could avoid his conscience rebuking him. So he can avoid accountability on the day of judgment. Obviously he won't avoid it, but he fools himself into that. And you find on the day of Ashura, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, when he spoke to those enemies, on that day he would spend it praying. And he used to say, this is the day that my grandfather Hussein was killed. This is the day that Imam al Hussein was slaughtered by the enemies. Yes, and then the Imam says, Imam al Rada, he says the month of Muharram was a sacred month, even during the time of the Jahiliyyah. Those, you know, the people of the Jahiliyyah, we always mention them as so uncivilized and they were the lowest human beings they had went to the lowest levels of humanity and they used to bury their own children but at least they had this much respect that in Muharram no killing, no fighting he says the nation of Rasulullah those that killed Imam al Hussein, they did not even respect the month of Muharram they were worse than the people of Jahiliyyah they killed the grandson of Rasulullah during the month of Muharram and they violated the sanctity of Rasulullah and then the Imam he says in Yawm al Hussein, aqraha jufunana wa asbala it says the day of Ashura, because of how much we cried, our eyes became bruised. Yes, brothers and sisters, the Imam is not exaggerating. Imam al Mahdi, alayhi salam, Allah ta'ala, Rajahu Sharif, we read in Dua and Nidbah, is lakiyanna alayka badala dumu'i dama. I will cry not, I will not shed tears for you. No, nothing. I will not shed tears for you. Cry blood. I will weep blood for you, Abu Abdullah. Imams don't exaggerate in these words. He means it. I will cry for you every day, every night, Ya Abu Abdullah. And the Imam, Imam al Rada alayhi salam, he says, فَعَلَى مِثْلِ الْحُسَيْنِ فَلْيَبْكِ الْبَاكُونَ If you want to cry, if you want a reason to cry, Cry for Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. In another tradition, Imam al Rida alayhi salam speaks to a man, one of them is by the name of Ibn Shabib. He tells him, Ibn Shabib, <coughs> Ibn Shabib, Al Kunba Kiel Fabuki. He says, if you were to cry for anything, O son of Shabib, then cry for my grandfather Hussein. Why should I cry? The Imam then says, He 
He says, for my grandfather, and he was slaughtered just like a sheep. And now, brothers and sisters, you might say he was treated even worse than a sheep. This is the son of Rasulullah. He was not even treated as a sheep. Imam Zain al Abidin, one day he's in the streets of Al Kufa. He's walking in the streets. He comes across a butcher. He's about to slaughter a sheep. He tells him, Did you give this sheep water? He tells him, Yabn Rasulullah, of course. We have mercy towards animals. We feed them water and then we kill them. All of a sudden, the Imam, he begins to cry. He, tore, he turns towards Karbala and he tells him, He says, even the sheep, even a sheep, when they want to slaughter, they feed it water. But you, my dear father, Hussein, they killed you while you were thirsty. And they denied you any drop of water. As-salamu ala al-Hussein. وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون وسيعلم الذين ظلموا آل محمد أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين أرايا غريب الطفوف توسد خديك كتبان غار